Keanu Reeves is on a speeding bus that if it goes below 50 miles an hour, it blows up, the bomb detonates, and everybody on the bus dies. Luke Skywalker has to defeat Darth Vader and blow up the Death Star or the Rebel Alliance is crushed. Why do we lean into these movies? Why do we feel so compelled to understand how it ends? Why are we so vested in these characters? Because they used the seven elements of a great story. Storytelling has been around since ancient times and it's how we learn. It's the best way for us to learn. And my guest today, JJ Peterson, is going to drop unbelievable nuggets on you for marketing and branding and clarifying your message, making your message so clear in story format that your customers and your prospects can't help but buy from you. JJ is the head of StoryBrand, the leading firm on helping companies clarify their message. I have read his books, watched his courses, even hired his his certified uh, story brand guides to help with my own companies. I'm a big fan of this guy, and I can tell you this episode is outstanding. As the head of story brand, he has used the story brand framework to help thousands of organizations clarify their message in order to grow their business. He holds a PhD in communication and has spent the last 20 years practicing and teaching communication theory. JJ has served in marketing and PR firms for two multinational nonprofit organizations, and he taught us a professor of communications, and he's spoken to thousands of people about creating a more clear message. JJ helps teams understand the power of story and how to use a repeatable process to create clear messages that can be used for any product or any service. So if you're listening and you've got a product or service, JJ can help you clarify your message. And when it comes to ensuring that your marketing and brand message is absolutely crystal clear, he is the go-to guy. I have been following him for a while and and uh, and taking in his content and read it, uh, reading his book, which we'll talk about today. So uh, without further ado, JJ, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Roger. It's fun to be here. Oh my gosh, my my pleasure. Um, I, I was just sharing with JJ before we went live here just for just a couple minutes that um, during COVID, I bought the Business Made Simple uh, online series, uh, that, that course, and that's when I was first introduced to JJ and just love the way he makes things incredibly simple. And I've been in sales and marketing and, and leadership for 30 some years and just the way he'll say things and you'll hear this today. So listeners, you're, you're in for a great treat. JJ, I have made, um, you know, your really the, 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 the foundation of your work, story brand, um, and story brand marketing mandated reading for everyone in my organization, uh, especially in the marketing department. I mean, it's mandated marketing and it's recommended for everybody else because it's, it's that powerful of a book. Um, your, your more recent book, marketing made simple uh, that you co-authored with Donald Miller. Um, that is now going to be mandated reading. Cause I, I, I was reading that for uh, prep for this interview. But I think for the listeners that you know may not have watched your courses or, or, or uh, uh, taken in your content or read your book, can you give a, a little background about you know not only who you are but really story brand as you know as this conduit as the guide that is helping so many businesses get clarity in their message? Maybe just talk about how you got into this. Yeah, it's, I mean, my story is kind of a wild story. It goes, you know, all the way back, but it really starts with my dad. It's probably the best storyteller in the entire world. I mean, he just really, I could see he was a pastor and, yeah. you know, I remember just him captivating rooms with story. So just from a very young age, like knowing who the storytellers were and kind of surrounding myself with them, specifically my yeah. dad and learning when we would go on, um, you know, family trips, we would listen to Garrison Keillor. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. Garrison Keillor. Like yeah. most people listen to music. My family listened to storytelling. Literally, like that's what I grew up doing. So I always had a fascination with it. And like kind of my my world of my adult career involved, you know, working for a couple different nonprofits and telling their mm -hmm. stories. Um, I did a stint in Hollywood for a while as an actor and a writer, and I even directed a documentary on street kids in Ethiopia. So oh. I kind of did that. And then I decided to get into teaching and I started studying story. And my PhD actually ended up being in communication, narrative theory, and um, specifically, ultimately, narrative marketing. 
And I, I, and part of it beyond just like the fascination and love of story was that when I was a 20 some year old kid out of college working for these nonprofits that were changing the world. I mean, literally like mm-hmm. one of them was we were building homes and when the rainy season came, if people had homes, they lived, if they didn't, there was a good chance they weren't going to. I mean, it was that kind wow. of level of impact. And I struggled to tell the story. I was staring at a blank page and here's these amazing stories of families and there's amazing opportunities for people to be involved in life-changing work. And I'm going, how do I create a website for this? How do I create email? Says, I'm 22 yeah. years old having these things. And I, that's where I started, you know, with that kind of struggle and through the years kind of, again, studied and learned. And then ultimately, um, I met Donna Miller when I was a professor, I was actually a professor mm-hmm. in Southern California, a uh, Dean of students at a university. And I brought him in to speak mm-hmm. and I had just sold a reality television show to a production company. So I was leaving that and he was like, Hey, I've got this new thing called story brand that I'm trying to help companies tell stories. And I was like, sure, I'll come check it out. And sure. that was 11 years ago and I haven't <laughs> left. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so that's kind of my world. And really we've spent the last, you know, 11 years in particular, really through the process, discovering that so many companies that are amazing and selling amazing products that they're so close to their products and services. And in reality, they're overthinking their messaging so much Mm. that they're not able to communicate in a way that invites customers into a story where they will buy the product. And people are losing money because of it. And frankly, customers' problems are not being solved. Like you have a product that solves people's problems and they're not getting it because they don't understand what you do. And so we've been spending the last 11 years working with everybody from huge, huge companies that, you know, are some of the top companies literally in the world, um, all the way down to mom and pop bakeries and helping them kind of clarify their message using the power of story so that they can help more people and grow their business. Yeah. Uh, You know, one of your mantras is don't be cute and clever. Just be really simple with your message. And I think um, as marketers, we try to you know, dance around what we actually do and, you know, make it sound different that it just tell them like you're, I love your, it's just tell them what you do yeah. and tell them how you yeah. can help them. Like it's not, you know, it's not rocket science, <laughs> but we, we screw it up so often, you know? Well, I think because a lot of it is we look to these huge brands that are very successful, like Apple and Nike or McDonald's, and they don't actually have to do marketing, to be honest. They have to, yeah. they do branding. And I yeah. believe that there's a difference between the two. Branding is really how you make people feel. So it's creating a tribal mentality. It's creating status. It involves logo and, you know, point of view, like humor versus drama and colors and design. That's all branding. Marketing, though, is really just answering three questions. What do you do? How does it make my life better? And how do I get it? By the the consumers asking those questions. And I think too many companies skip to the branding part. They really focus on the look of their website and their tagline. Like they try to come up with the next, just do it, or, you know, where's the beef? (laughs) And they, they spend a lot of money and energy on that. And so they're trying to be cute and clever and they ignore the clear, the clarity. And really, if you can just answer those three questions, what do you do? How does it make my life better? And how do I get it? And put that in all of your marketing you're going to be more successful than if you start with clever and cute. Yeah. I I was just trying to sign up for something and I had to go through so many screens and create an account. And I was just like, I just want to buy this drop in service thing, you know, and, yeah. and I abandoned it. Yeah. I just, I, I was like, no, the hell with this. And it, because there was so much friction on what do I have to do? How many hoops do I have to jump through to get this? And it was never explained like, Hey, you do need to make a profile. Then we're going to ha- ask you to do this. And then you, then, you know, you'll be able to buy, but that wasn't explained. So I didn't know where this, that trail was going to end. And I'm like, I'm out of here, you know? Um, but if they would have done that and defined what I needed to do, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm in. If you can talk about really this, the, the, the importance and, in, 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 you know, the importance of telling story versus like feature advantage benefits. So many yeah. companies, here's our feature, the advantage to you is, and the benefit is, which is an important way to at the, at the end, I think, to explain what you do. 
but you you're very deliberate about that in in your book marketing made simple around storytelling trumps everything the feature advantage benefit comes much much later if ever at all so can you speak to that yeah and and those things aren't bad or wrong they just i think are often told in the wrong way and mm. the biggest thing to understand is that uh, so uh, you, you said I explained things simply, but I, I am going to get a little nerdy here for a second sure, with sure. my, <laughs> I, I paid for a PhD, so I need to at least show off a little bit there. I so, love it. I uh, love it. But part of my study in, in my, my PhD was in an area called narrative transportation. What narrative transportation is, is really this idea that when you experience, when an audience experiences a good story they transport themselves into that story. And we, and so if you've ever been in a movie and you've laughed or you've cried or you've jumped when something scary happened, you've experienced narrative transportation. Now, what we mean by good story is that it actually follows the rules of story. There is fidelity in the story. The story has coherency. There's all these rules that good stories have to follow. When a movie or a book follows those story, those rules, they are, become a good story and people will experience higher levels of narrative transportation. It can actually be measured in the better the story, the higher levels of narrative transportation. Okay. Now, the research goes a little bit further and says that the higher levels of narrative transportation that people experience, the more influence that story then has on their thoughts and actions. So there's actual measurable data that shows yeah the better the story, the more influence on thoughts and actions. Now, they, they it started with showing this in books and in movies, but then they actually transferred this to marketing. And they've been able to show that when a company tells a good story in their marketing, on their website, in emails, in videos, on social media, that people can experience narrative transportation there as well. Mm -hmm. However, in the same thing applies to movies is if the story is told incorrectly, out of order, it lacks fidelity and coherency, then people, it will have less influence on their thoughts and actions. So there's actually a ton of data around yeah. the idea of the influence of story. And, and most data even suggests that it actually is the most powerful way to influence thoughts and actions is through story. And that even yeah. goes all the way back to Aristotle and Plato in Poetics. They argued that if they want to change culture, change society, the best way to do that is through story. So yeah. story is incredibly powerful to move people to action. However, it's not just about telling like a funny story or telling a dramatic or heart moving story. It's about telling a cohesive story that makes sense. It actually has to make sense in our brain. And so what we do at StoryBrand is we actually teach people what are the elements of story. There really are seven elements of any good story. And when you follow that story, what you do is you actually create something cohesive that has fidelity, that creates narrative transportation, that ultimately has more influence. And the biggest key to this, this is the biggest paradigm shift and the biggest, I would argue, mistake that a lot of companies are making is when they're trying to create marketing, what they're doing is trying to tell their story. We have people come to us all the time that says, please, can you help us tell our story? And at first we always go, yes. And then when we get in there after they've paid us the money, we show them <laughs> it's actually not your story. Your yep. job is to invite your customer into a story. It helped them experience that narrative transportation. And in that story, they're the hero. And yep. your company is not. Your company is not the hero. Your company is the guide. You are Yoda, you are Gandalf, you are not the main character. You are the one, the wise sage who helps the hero win. And when you do that, when you tell that story, invite customers in, they win and ultimately you win in the process. This segment is sponsored by Rockbox Fitness Franchising. Take control of your destiny and join the boutique fitness revolution with Rockbox Fitness. If you're ready to make a real impact in your community and own your own business, that empowers people to achieve their best life, then Rockbox is the opportunity you've been looking for. They provide comprehensive support from site selection, upfit, training, and turnkey marketing, so you can open your studio with confidence and a strong recurring revenue member base. Visit rockboxfitness.com 
and click on Franchise Opportunities to learn more about this exciting venture in the fast-growing boutique fitness industry. It's time to turn your passion for fitness and for business into a thriving venture. Story brand that the the original book had me hooked when he used Star Wars as an analogy. Yeah. I'm like, all right, I'm in. I get it. Like this all resonates with me because I'm a mega fan from when I was seven years old. You know, so when you that's a great you, you mentioned about you know clients will say, hey, help us tell our story. Okay, sure. Okay, now we're under contract. Let me tell you, this really works. So can you peel back peel back the curtain just a little bit? And you know, you meet with a client. They're saying, hey, I want to tell my story. How do you ascertain where they're at in their process and say, okay, we need to start from here. We need to strip it all the way back to the beginning. Like just what is, you know, in, in a nutshell, what is your process to help align, orient that company and start building the hero's journey, which is the customer, not theirs? Yeah. When I'm, you know, when I'm working with clients, one of the first things I do is they, they're like, we'll just send you all of our collateral. And I go, don't let me look at your website. And if I can't, within about three seconds uh, of looking at their website, answer the three questions I mentioned earlier, what do you do? How does it make my life better? And how do I get it? In a very clear and simple way, then I know I can help this company. <laughs> like if they've got it down, I won't, I'll say, don't hire me. You're doing great. You yeah. know, I will, I've turned down people who are like, I'm not going to make you more money. But if yeah. I go to their website, that's always where I start. Because if they send me a bunch of collateral, then I'm like in their world and I'm, you yeah. know, I basically start repeating back to them what they already have been saying for years that hasn't been working. But yeah. if I look at their website and uh, like I was just with a client the other day, they're, they, well, here, I'll, I'll quiz you. Okay. So yeah. here's what their website had on it. It had a mountain range on the backside of like a large forest. And then it said, we help you conquer your biggest mountains. What do you think that company did? I have no idea. <laughs> they were a software company that helps smaller companies with distribution of products. I would not ascertain that from nobody Mountain would. Range. Nobody <laughs> yeah. would. I, <laughs> and so that company, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I can make you millions of dollars in about five minutes. Yeah. And and that's the kind of thing I see all the time. Now that's an extreme example. Sure. But I see that all the time of companies like trying to be kind of clever and use this like big language tag, like, no, no, no. What are people going to Google to find you? If that's not on your website, then you're not being clear enough. And yeah. so then we go in and we really start with that space. We really just start with some clarity and understanding of why it's important to have clarity in order to reach your customers. Yeah. Love it. I love it. That makes so much sense. If you will, please uh, talk about that. You talked about seven elements, like the story brand framework, um, and, it, and it is pervasive through all of your your videos, through your social content, um, certainly through through the books that you've authored. Um, talk about that framework because it, it once I understood that, I, then every movie that I've loved, I've started playing back through that. Every book I've read, I'm like, oh my god, they just followed that saying, you know. Like it's incredibly predictable, but if you will speak to that, please. Yeah. So let me give a high level overview just from, yeah. and, and all the, everybody listening right now is kind of take off your business and marketing hat and put on your screenwriter hat for a second here, because yeah. we're just going to walk through what, what does it look like to tell a good story and what are the main elements? And if, if we're actually writing a screenplay, we'd have to put in maybe like 32 or 34 plot points, depending on what you're writing. But in its most basic form, every story has these seven elements. And I'll go over them just all the way through and then kind of come back and explain a little bit. So the first is that you ha need to have a character who wants something. That character, number two, has to experience a problem. Three, then that character meets a guide. Four, that guide gives the hero a plan. Five, that results in call to action. There's a moment the hero has to act. And there are then stakes in the stories, which is six and seven, that the story has to result in be foreshadowing success or failure. What success of the story looks like or failure. So in its most basic form, that first piece is that in within about nine minutes of a movie, um, and it is formulaic, within about yeah. nine minutes of a movie, you have to know what a hero wants. 
And that here, it has to be very clear. Uh, two mistakes screenwriters make when when writing this part of the movie is they make it too vague. So the hero, you know, just wants fulfillment or happiness. No, no, no. They need to destroy the Death Star, win the right. Hunger Games. So it has to be very clear. And it really has to be one thing. The hero in their life wants 500 things, but really, if it's a good story that's clear, it, they can only want one thing. Then the story then, that kind of gets us into the story, finds out our hero's motivation. Then the story gets interesting when the hero encounters a problem. If there is no problem, there is no story. It's a very boring yeah. story if Liam Neeson finds out his daughter is not really kidnapped <laughs> and they, for the seventh time, and they just are walking around shopping or looking at colleges. Very boring sure. story. It has to be a big problem that the hero is experiencing. And the rest of the movie really is about them overcoming that problem. The problem is the hook of the story. It makes us pay attention. But then the hero has to, we know as an audience that the hero can't get out of this problem on their own. They have to meet a guide who helps them overcome this. So that's why you always see Yoda, Gandalf, Haymitch. Lionel in King's Speech. You have all Aslan in Chronicles of Narnia. There's always somebody who's there, who's wiser, who has been there, done that, who's already conquered the day, who helps the hero win. Then that guide gives the hero a plan. And you'll hear the phrase, what's the plan? Or here's the plan pretty much in every single movie you've ever seen. You, like Think about how many movies just like, you know, they sweep things across the table and put down a map and they're like, all right, here's the plan. Well, it's in every movie, but it's because it's there to show that there's a clear path forward for the hero to win. Then there's a moment that the hero has to be in or out. So there is a call to action. That's why there's so many like ticking time bombs in movies. It forces the hero to move. Otherwise, they're just going to delay action, delay action, delay action. So we have to kind of push the hero to move. And then we're rooting for a happy ending. We, we kind of have a vision of what that can be like. The guy gets the girl, the girl gets the promotion, the team wins the race. There's all of these things that we're rooting for. And then there's also some kind of pain that they're trying to avoid, some kind of failure. So we know that if the bomb goes off, everybody will die, right? Yeah. We just know this is going to happen. So that's in every, that's every movie. Yeah. Character, problem, guide, plan, call to action, success, and failure. Now, we can take our marketing hats and put them back on. <laughs> yeah. And so how does this then apply? Let me, go. Let me ask you yeah. one quick question before we go there. I didn't hear you say that the, the story must have a villain. Yeah. Is that true or not? No, every story doesn't need a villain. Um, they, it, it can help move the story along faster sometimes if okay. there's a villain. Um, and it can add more stakes to the story and it actually personifies the problem in a very strong way, but it's not necessary, um, in, in a story. Yeah. Cause sometimes the, the villain is even the person themselves, the hero themselves, <laughs> depending on this the story. So, so, um, so it, it can, we talk about that in our book a little bit about how having a villain is really a powerful tool, but you don't, it doesn't have to be there for the story. Gotcha. Okay. And I interrupt you. You started to say if we put our marketing, if we take off our screenwriter's hat, put our marketing hat back on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and specifically why I'll get to why we don't use the villain in marketing a lot. And when we get to that part, but so if we put our, if we put our marketing hat back on what we're looking at in creating a good story using those same principles is what, and this is how we help companies is we help them create what's called a brand script. So a okay. basically help them create talking points for these seven elements for their customer's story. So the first one is we identify what does the character want? Well, the customer is the hero. So what does your customer want? Literally, like if they were going to Google you, what are they Googling to try to find you? That's almost how clear we want to have it. Like, you know, so many times I, I see people who are say, uh, they're business coaches and on their website, it says, "We, I help you find the life you want. And I'm like, okay, are you a therapist? Are you a life coach? Are you, yep. no, say you're a business coach. I help you achieve your business goals, goals through coaching. Be that clear. 
So that's the kind of content we want in that section of a brand script is what is it that your customer wants? Then we identify what is the problem that your customer is experiencing that your product or service solves. And that's really, really important. That led in the same way that in a movie, the bigger the problem, the more interesting the story. The it, same thing in your customer story. The only reason they're paying attention to your marketing is because they know you can solve their problem. So you have to talk about your customer's problem over and over and over again to hook them into your marketing story. Then you have to create language around positioning yourself as the guide. And that means you need to show that you have empathy to your customer's problems, but you also have competency. You have authority to solve it because you've been there, done that. The reason why Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi can help Luke Skywalker is because they already became Jedis and yep. they've already fought Darth Vader, right? They, yep. that's the only reason they matter in the story. If Luke wants to become a farmer, then Yoda doesn't matter in the story. His uncle sure. is the one who's the guy, yeah. right? So the yep. only reason you matter in your customer story is if you can position yourself as a guide to their journey, which means show empathy to their problems and authority to solve it. Okay. Then, you need to give your customers a plan to show them how to do business with you. What is the way forward to work with you? You brought up the example earlier of trying to go through the process of purchasing this product from a company. If they would have said at the very beginning, first you do this, second you're going to do this, third you do this, they would have shown a clear path forward for you to yeah. quote unquote win the day by buying their product. Yeah. They didn't do that. They made it confusing. They made you wonder if you were doing the right thing. In the context of marketing, what this really means is you're answering two questions. Either, how do I get started? And that's really, so you're saying step one, schedule a call. Step two, we'll actually do an assessment of your business. Step three, we'll create a plan to move forward. So one, two, three of this is how to get started, or this is how we work. This is how we do it. First, we put you in an accountability group. So you actually have mentors to walk with you Two. We set specific goals, and three, we get, we walk with you along the journey to keep you accountable. This is how we do it. So that's yeah. what you're creating in a plan. Then you need to have a clear call to action. Have you called your customers to action, letting them know what the next step is they need to take in order to buy a product or service? So on your website, that should be buy now, shop now, schedule a call, book an appointment, anything like that that's very, very clear cannot be vague. There was a recent study that said that 70% of small businesses in America do not have a clear call to action on their website. Mm -hmm. And people are losing millions of dollars because yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. That's like putting the checkout scans at a grocery store in the back in the changing rooms and trying to make people find them. Yeah. Put them up front. People need to know how to buy this product. And then lastly, you need to show your customer what life is like if they do buy your product or service, that's success. So you're using language around benefits of mm -hmm. the features of your product or what they're also going to miss out on or what pain they're going to continue to experience if they don't, that's failure. And really what you're doing is creating talking points for each of these elements. Then once you have that brand script and really it should just be a couple sentences in each section you then have the foundation for all of your collateral. So then you take those m talking points and you say, how do I make this into a website? In the header, you need to be really clear about what you offer and how people get it. The next section on your website needs to be about your customer's problem. What pro Talk about their problems. The next section might be the plan. The next section might be your guide section where you're showing testimonies or statistics and offering some empathy. You want beautiful pictures of smiley, happy people using your product or service, not mountains that people can climb, <laughs> you know, sure. and all of that. So that it, then once you have those, really that really core piece of your marketing, that message that's really clear with those seven elements, you can then turn that into a million different things. Let me say one more thing about when you mentioned villain. So in the process of working with companies, sometimes there is an obvious villain that they are they are defeating through the process. And um, if I look at 
big brands, like if you ever see any kind of allergy medicine, they often will personify uh, germs or they will person not even germs, uh, you know, allergens or allergens, yeah. all in. Or if you're, you know, going against cold, like they do mucus and it's all this grain monster or germs. Yeah. If you're aerosol, you know, like Lysol that you're trying to clean. You've seen those commercials where there's bugs yeah. or germs that are personified and this brand then conquers those as villains. That's really effective. However, I actually advise most companies not to create a villain unless it's really obvious for two reasons. One, what they will do in creating a villain is sometimes they will make their competitors the villain. And the research actually shows when you bash your competitors specifically, your brand is hurt by that and their brand is hurt. So yeah. if you go back to the cola wars of the 80s and 90s when Pepsi and Coke were going at each other, when yeah. they specifically went after each other, both brands suffered. Whereas when they just promoted their own stuff, both brands continue to grow. The yeah. other mistake people can make in creating a villain in the in their marketing and messaging is they accidentally make their customer the villain in yeah. that they will say something like they're creating a brand script or brand story. They'll say something like the villain is you were not prepared or don't have the skills to run the business the way you want. Mm. And what they're trying to do is make like this, they're schooling the, the villain or they're, you know, the fact that they like have this big vision to start a business, but they don't know how to do marketing. And in reality, what you're doing is you're calling your customer stupid. <laughs> yeah. So I actually advise most companies to stay away from villains unless you can personify something that is like intangible and everybody hates like yeah. germs and pollen. <laughs> there is no such thing as a, as a pollen uh, monster. So they have to personify something we can't see, feel, or touch in a way. So that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, your book, um, uh, for if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, you can't see this, but if you're on YouTube, I'm holding up um, JJ's book, Marketing Made Simple, which is really, he's talking about story brand, uh, which was maybe the genesis of this book. But marketing made simple, it goes a lot deeper, a lot deeper into uh, each of those categories. Um, and, and again, reading the, the book to prepare for this interview, uh, there were there were like five things that really jumped out at me. I've got it all dog eared and underlined for different things. And I'll go back to it, you know, many, many times. It's, it's a it's a resource guide. But I wanted to read off or just read like these five different things. And maybe you just give like a 30 second response and, and thoughts to, to each of these. Um, one of the th uh, the things you write is marketing made simple will cause people to memorize your offer. What do you mean by that? We, in marketing really is about memorization. You want people to internalize what it is that you offer, what you do, and also be able to spread that that language around yeah. for other people. So if I hear somebody else has a problem, I can go, oh, you know what you, if somebody says to me, I have a headache, I go, oh, I have aspirin, right? You have yeah. a solution to that problem because aspirin has told us or Tylenol or Advil has told us over and over again, we fix headaches. If you make your messaging confusing and overwhelming, people will not be able to internalize or memorize it. So the more simple you keep the message and the more focused on their problems and really making them the hero, it's much easier to memorize. But otherwise, if it's over too complicated, they're out. They're out. Okay. Makes sense. Um, I love this statement. The problem is the hook. Speak to that. And you mentioned it earlier. So yeah, that's speak really to that. in a story. It, it's what makes a story interesting. You know, if I was telling you a story about my day and it was just I was listing facts, like I woke up and I got excited about having coffee and I sat on my couch and I got dressed and I boring story. But if I, I said, get enough of, I get enough of that for my wife, yeah. that's fine. Well, yeah. I won't tell her you said that. I won't tell you. The, but, you know, but if I said. You know, so I woke up this morning and I grabbed my coffee and I'm sitting on my couch and all of a sudden a car came through my window and I heard sirens everywhere. And then I stopped that story and I just said, anyway, uh, what are we doing for lunch? You would go, wait, hold on. What? Back it up. What, yeah. what happened? Is everybody here? You want to know the end of that story because the big, I just introduced a big problem into what yep. we're talking about. Well, it's the same thing with your customers. When you introduce a problem, when you talk about what the, the pain that they're experiencing or the struggle they're experiencing, 
they want to know where that story is going. So it's saying something like, you know how a lot of people spend a lot of money on their website and it just doesn't convert the way they want? And then they're like, yeah, I do know about that. And then what they're <laughs> waiting for is for you to then keep going. If I just stopped yeah. right there, I'd go, yeah, interesting. <laughs> like, no, no, they're hooked. So now yeah. I can say, you know, the reason why is because their message is unclear. And at StoryBrand, yeah. we actually fix that. And so that's what I mean by the story is the hook. People actually lean in when you start, when you introduce a problem into the story. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Um, uh, you have in there, I'm going to use like air quotes here, keep asking which results in. So yeah, you know, as you're building copy, as you're writing copy, keep asking yourself which results in. Just yeah. speak to that maybe. So I this comes from the idea of talking about your customer's success, what they're going to experience after they buy your product or service. So what most people do is they focus on that feature is they say, well, we have, you know, we help you clarify your message using a story brand framework. And we think that we've explained it enough and really hooked them with just the feature of what it is. But in my brain, when I'm creating copy in my brain, then I just tell myself which results in what. And I will then say, your whole team will be on the same page. Your marketing will be more effective. You're going to have a more uh, website that converts better. And then I go another step and I say, which results in what? You're able to grow your business. You're able to pay your employees more. You're going to go on more vacation, which re results in, and I go to the next level. So I yeah. ask myself three or four levels down the road of most people stop at the pain just being solved, but we want short-term, mid-range, and long-term success. Now, what's interesting about that is you can't do that with failure. You can't go down that road with long-term failure for people or they won't lean into that story. So yeah. if their website isn't working, I can say you're going to miss out on offers. You're not going to convert as much as you want. And that's short-term failure. But if I then go to, which means you're going to lose in the market, which means you may have to shut your business down, which <laughs> means your family is going to leave you. We, we can't do that. That can't be a part of the story. <laughs> sure. So with success, you can kind of keep going, which results in, which results in, which results in, and create language for copy that you can pull from for your website, emails, all that stuff. But with yeah. failure, you actually can't do that. You just have to just kind one, of do one step results in and be done. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, I think that's a huge tip. Huge tip. Um, this one I love cause man, I'm a long copywriter. I, I, I grew up writing long copy and, you know, and realize now how confusing some of that copy may have been. You write commas are not your friend. Yeah. We often think that we're adding a lot of value to our product, but when we say you're going to, this will result in you saving time, saving money, getting more da da da, and all this. And what's oddly enough is our brain starts to water down that promise. And so when you add a comma to a sentence, it actually diminishes the power of the sentence. It's like adding the word really to a sentence. If I say there's all these studies that show if I say I love you or I say I really love you, people actually perceive I love you as being stronger. Yeah, And so when you're adding extra words, a lot of people think we're adding power to the sentence. We're actually diminishing the power. So um, my rule for myself is I just say commas are not your friends. Anytime there's a, especially in a list, if you're making a list, just keep it to two. This segment is sponsored by Beamlight Sauna Franchising. Are you looking to take control of your destiny and own your own business? Do you want a great brand in a rapidly growing market? Well, Beamlight Sauna is a nationwide health and wellness franchise with amazing opportunities in select markets. You can bring the power of infrared sauna and red light therapy to your community while you build a thriving business. Beamlight Sauna offers support that includes site selection, build out, even pre-launch programs and turnkey marketing so you can open your studio with a large recurring revenue member base. To learn more about business ownership and franchise opportunities in the fast-growing health and wellness space, go to beamlightsauna.com. That's B-E-E-M, lightsauna.com. And click on Franchise Opportunities to learn more. All right, number five, JJ, uh, free value leads to trust. 
Yeah, the way that you can create reciprocity with customers is by offering them a ton of value before they even buy anything from you. So on Instagram or with downloads on your website, free giveaways, um, you, anything you give away and ask, say, and for an email in exchange for, you want to deliver value for. So you, if you're, I work with companies and I'll say, do you have any lead generators on your website? And they'll say, yeah, we have a testimonial video. And I'm like, that, that's marketing. That's not actually value for me. I'm, that's really yeah. actually you showing me how good you are. Instead, what you should do is three tips to make your website convert more. If I implement those three tips on my website and I start seeing higher rates of conversion, I am now going to trust you. And there's a sense of reciprocity that's created there to where now I'm willing to pay you money in order to solve my problem. So you always want to look for ways to give your customers value before they even give you a dollar or an hour of their time on a call. Um, how, about, how about how about an email? Like, so yeah. would you say those three tips, you have to go through an email wall, so yes. to speak, or would you offer that up first? And then maybe step two is a better lead magnet that's worth more value. I mean, or, you know, I if, if it comes to a download, I'm always asking for an email. So I can okay. actually track the value of that. On Instagram or LinkedIn, when you're giving away some tips or tricks on there, I think that continues to build your brand in that sense. But then I would actually then follow that up with a webinar that they can sign up for or a PDF they can download, but always in exchange for that email, you're going to be able to track those, um, those customers better. And you're ultimately going to have higher rates of conversion because you can follow up with sales sequences and more value, more videos to keep them connected. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, thank you for, because I, the book I thoroughly enjoyed. And again, we'll go back to it. I wanted to get your thoughts because you're, you, you're very qualified, uniquely qualified to answer this. Uh, is there, is there a difference between doing marketing and messaging and story branding for a nonprofit versus a for-profit venture? Yeah, um, it, the, that's a nuanced question. The quick answer yeah. is no. The quick answer okay. is no that what you really want to do is view your donors as your customers, right? Okay. Whether they're donating time or money. And it's the same principles. You're identifying what is it that they want, what are the problems they're experiencing that you can help solve, and so on and so on. Now, here's where the nuance comes in. The n one way to tell the story differently. So you can either make your donor the hero, which a lot of nonprofits are really uncomfortable with, to be honest, but it works really well. If you've ever said, you know, sponsor a well in Africa for your birthday or sponsor well in Africa so that your gift to your mom, it matters this year. In yeah. that context, you're actually making your donor the hero, whether you realize yep. it or not. And so those are very effective and they very, work really well. But what I often do with nonprofits is I shift it a little bit and say, you want to make the people that you serve the hero of the story. So mm -hmm. when you're creating a brand script and talking points, you're identifying what is it that they want? What is the problem they are experiencing? How do you position yourself as a guide to them? What is your plan for them? The only difference is the call to action then goes to the donor, not the recipient. And then gotcha. we finish out the story with success and failure. If people give, this is what life can be like. If they don't, this is what pain will continue to experience. Gotcha. So that's, that's kind of the... That's the the shift is the hero is really the people you serve. And then one more thing, and this is really, really important for people, is there really are what I would consider four different types of nonprofit work. There is release, development, empowerment, and justice. I, I think everything kind of falls, and I learned that from Food for the Hungry, is that really those four things, relief, development, empowerment, and justice. No matter what work you're in, I would argue you still fill out the brand script to those for those stories, but you're going to lean more heavily in different areas based on the work you're doing. So let's start with relief really quick. There is, and I'm, I'm going to be a little crass here, but there is a lot of information and research around the idea that basically sick children will make more money than smiley, happy children. 
yeah. in images. In when it comes to relief, short term relief, if there's an emergency, a tornado, a, a tsunami, a, a plague that has come through an area, war, in those moments, you can actually show the tragedy and the hardship, and it will be more effective because those images will wake up people to the immediate need. If you then move into development and empowerment of communities, you actually can't stay with the tragic images and the tragic language. You have to move into hopeful or donors will turn away. They won't pay attention anymore. So you have to lean into the success side of things. So it, this is where you are bringing happy, smiley children, completed homes, release in, in a community. Then when you move in, if you're in justice work, you can actually do both because there might be something immediate that we need to get taken care of or there's long-term work. So if you're working in, um, you know, climate change right now, you actually, if it's, that's a long-term problem that we're solving or that that nonprofit is solving. And if you're constantly showing people broken homes, tsunamis, the world falling apart, you will lose donors because you actually can't live in that relief space. That's where people get yeah. confused is they keep thinking they're doing relief. It, relief and the negative imagery works to wake people up. But once you move into the other spot parts, you need to move more into talking about the plan and talking about success. Is it fair to say then, just because I'd love clarity on this, you, um, this is all part of a campaign. So relief, you wake them up, but then you move that donor, prospect, customer, whatever, you move them into the next part of the journey, which is empowerment. And uh, development, one. yeah. But you can do that all. So you can show the the sick ch child, wake up, but then, okay, now let's show you what your, your money's going to do. And Yeah, so if you're, okay. like, say, you're, you're bringing in aid to a, to a place that it was hit by a tornado, Let's move away from children. <laughs> but, yeah, sure, yeah, exactly. fair, fair it's, enough. Fair it's enough. true. I mean, it's all true, but that, people understand those images. Yeah. But you know, when you're talking about a home that was destroyed or a town that was destroyed, that they need immediate relief right now. We need electricity. We need water. We need food. We need clothes in this moment. For in that season, you can actually show the images of the town being destroyed been destroyed and then we're going to actually find more people that are going to engage in that if then you continue to use those images for the next six months and you as a organization have already moved into development and empowerment so building new schools building new homes and empowering people with new jobs for them to build the homes all of that if you're still trying to show the tornado damage you're not actually going to get people engaged you have to move into that plan of where we're moving forward and that people have moved on. Oh, love it. Love it. Um, I got one more question for you. Then I'm just going to ask you some some uh, kind of a standard three-question thing I do at the end. Um, marketing uh, is fascinating to me. Buyer behavior, consumer behavior, the psychology of pricing. Like I, I'm a total nerd on this stuff. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, and, and so I get asked a lot, where's marketing going? Where do you think, you know, and I, my answer is I don't have a clue. If I had that answer, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> you know, I mean, so wh where do you see, you know, especially, and I'm really asking in the context of social media, influencer marketing, it feels like the game has changed some to where the companies aren't marketing as directly. They're marketing through other people, you know, depending on the brand and the product. I would just love to hear your take on and I'm, I'm sure story brand still applies, like yeah. still applies, but it seems like the vessel that's maybe that's the word I'm trying to find the vessel that we're using to get to the consumer has shifted what, to, your thoughts? to some degree. What's really interesting is when you study the research around emails and how many people are still using email and email effectiveness and the return on investment, email is still the number one, even over yeah. social media. So wow. you actually receive I believe it's a 4,200% return on investment for every dollar spent on email. Wow. Whereas including social media and targeted ads and all of that stuff, that is a 3,600% higher return than any other form of marketing investment. 
Now, the numbers are dipping a little bit on what people are buying off of email and engagement in email, but it's like moving from like 93% of people say they bought something off of email. Now it's like 92. It, it, it's insane. And so, yes, social media. Yes, all of that. But what I would still argue is the most effective way to continue to move forward in marketing is to start with social media and influencers and things like that, but try to work very quickly to move that community onto your own platform. So move them into your email database. Yep. When you build your property, your your business essentially on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you do not own that data. You do not, you're not responsible for what happens. If Instagram goes down, you're done. Or if yeah. Instagram changes their algorithm or access or anything like that, you're done. You yeah. don't have control over that. What you do have control over is email. And yeah. so when it comes to social media, what I would say is it there there is an increase of awareness of using social media. People are buying off of social media like crazy these days, yes. But typically it's because they first heard about it there and then they were moved to another platform, their website, yeah. the e email. But when partnering with social media or even using social media for yourself, you still want to take these principles into action. If you as a business or a brand are going and personally doing it, you need to identify and be talking about your customers' problems. You need to be only, the only way you talk about yourself is you position yourself as a guide with empathy yeah. and authority. You all, you talk about the plan, you show success, you create aspirational identity. All of those things are the same. And if you're partnering with a social media influencer to make that happen, you're looking for people who are living that story already. You don't want to partner with somebody who you think will just go viral or it will, um, but it doesn't, isn't the type of person who would actually use your brand just because they have, you know, granted, if you can get, you know, one of the Kardashians to promote you, sure. you're going to win, sure. except for yeah. that if it's not for your audience. Yeah. Right. You you can actually have much more success with micro influencers. And that's where a lot of trending is going is with micro yeah. influencers who specifically can target your specific audience who are living the story your customers are living already. Yeah. I, I and I, I'm I'm so glad you talked about email marketing because I talked to so many colleagues and, and counterparts in, in business. Oh, email. No, it's all filtered. Nobody reads it anymore. Well, that's not true. And and like you said, you own that traffic. You own it. Nobody can take that away from you where one, you know, click of a toggle button on Facebook or Instagram and you're out. Exactly. <laughs> they, and they decide that, not you. Yeah. Exactly. Um, wonderful. All right. So I always ask these last three questions and, and this will be fun with you. So um, the first one is pretty straightforward. I'm sure you're incredibly well read on, you know, business or business biographies, but it doesn't have to be a business book. But um, obviously, you've got an amazing book, Marketing Made Simple, and I, my listeners know I'm an avid reader. Is there a book that you've read recently, 20 years ago, whenever, when you set it down, JJ, you said, uh, okay, that I'm going to think about the world differently now. Like that, that's forever change my outlook on whatever it was. What, what book would that be? Well, the most recent one, and I would genuinely say that this changed me more than anything other than story brand, is Will yeah. Gadara's Unreasonable Hospitality. Mm, okay. That book is unbelievable. He basically, Will Gadara owned and ran the number one restaurant in the world, 11 Madison Park. And he talks about how the way that they became the number one was through hospitality. And I genuinely believe that hospitality, other than a clear message, so if I believe companies have a clear message and a good product, you have to have a good product, but a clear message and actually create meaningful experiences with their customers, th that's your two biggest competitive advantages in the marketplace. I have heard about that book and I have not read it, so that-, that oh, get it, get it and listen. Yeah, with, I'm just telling you, it will change, it will change everything. Yeah, yeah, within 10 minutes I'll have it ordered. I yeah. promise you. Uh, is this is it is it the is this the restaurant where the, they overheard somebody talking about a, a hot dog in yes. New York and they had and they okay, I've heard that story yes. which is super powerful. So yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm 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 going to buy it. Fantastic. Second to last question. So, this is a little bit different and it's certainly not to meant, meant to be morbid, but let's say we fast forward to the end of your life, JJ, and uh, you know, you've passed on and, and you're looking at your funeral from above or from wherever, and there's a loved one reading your eulogy, but that loved one is only allowed three words, three descriptors 
to describe the, the impact you had on them, the impact you had on everyone that's attending that funeral or the world. What three words do you hope they choose as descriptors for you that would describe the life you lived? I think it's just a sentence, a great guide. Mm. It's actually three words. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that works. That's, I mean, that's it. You know, a great guide that, that you uh-huh. know, it really is, I think, for the ultimate for me, it, when I now, of course, when I watch movies, that's what I'm always looking at is yeah, I don't actually pay attention to the hero. I look at the guide. The guide is the one who's steady. The guide is actually the strongest character in the story. And they're living their lives in a way that serves others. I mean, Yoda yeah. and Obi-Wan and Gandalf did not have to. They could go off and be their own heroes. They could have their own jet, you know, worlds. And yet yeah. they've given their lives to help other people win. Uh, there's no better... Thing that I could do with my life. I love that. I mean, you're so in line with everything you do. I love it. And then last question, second to last question, because I want to uh, have people find out where they can they can follow you and find you. If you had a magic wand and tonight you wave that magic wand, JJ, and you can make one change to the world, the world operates in a different way. If you wave that magic wand tonight, we wake up tomorrow, how is the world different according to JJ? <laughs> I mean, there's so, oh, wow, that's a great question. And there's so many things. I think if uh, if I really just had to say one, mm-hmm. is it that uh, people would learn to give? And I, I mean that in like the broadest sense, and, and there's multiple reasons for that. The world would be better. More people would receive a lot, but actually there's also a lot of research, and this also goes into the guide thing, that yeah. we actually find more contentment and joy in our lives when we actually serve and give to others. And in the most basic sense, like if I go to a restaurant that I love and the food's amazing, the service is amazing, if I go back to that same restaurant, I actually won't experience the same level of joy that second time if I do the exact same. However, yeah. if I take you with me to that restaurant and you experience joy, my level of joy can actually increase beyond what happened the first time. Because I invited you in and I helped you experience joy and greatness. It's the same thing with gift giving. It's why people love gift giving. I can buy something for myself. If I buy that same thing again, I won't experience the same amount of joy. But if I give that thing to you, my joy goes up. So I actually wish people would learn that the secret in life is actually not about getting. It's about giving and about being a servant in that way, you know, and not not in a weak way, but that you want to be powerful. You want to be Gandalf. You want to be Yoda. Learn to give. Learn to give and yeah. be grit, be generous with your time, energy, and money. And other people's lives will be better and yours will be better because of it. Hmm. That's a beautiful, beautiful answer. Wow. Um, most important question. And, and again, I am, I, I told you when we started, like I am uh, such a fan uh, I love your books. I, I've bought your online courses. Uh, we've actually here at Rockbox Fitness, uh, one of the franchises I own, we've hired a story brand guide to help us. And it's funny, Gabby, my director of marketing, will come out of those meetings or open her door and she's like, God, it was right in front of me. I mean, I just I just couldn't see, you know, and 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 your and your certified guides like just helped clarify what, what we were trying to do. Um, so I'm like, I'm telling my audience and the listeners, like, you know, if they need help. It is, it's, it's, and, and the services were reasonable, you know, it was a reasonable fee and it helped us make a lot more money. So how can people follow you, find you, get a hold of you if they want your help? On all the socials, me personally, I'm just at Dr. JJ Peterson. So you can kind of find me there, but what I would love to give for everybody who's listening is we actually have an online tool that is our brand script where people can go on and actually fill out these talking points for their business create the language around their customer story. And we have a free version of this online that people can go to storybrand.com slash SB7. So story, SB7. Yep, okay. storybrand.com slash SB7. And you'll sign up and you'll just put your information in. And then from there, you get access to the framework that you can actually create brand scripts, save them, send them to your team and all of that. So everybody can go there. And that's the best way to kind of find out about story brand and working with story brands in particular. Perfect. Perfect. Well, and we'll actually put that uh, in the, in the show notes. So the links uh, live right there. 
JJ, thank you so much for joining. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I could geek out with you all day long on on uh, story and, and branding and marketing. So thank you so much for coming on. Oh, today. this has been a blast. Thank you for tuning in to the Thrive More podcast. Don't forget to take a look at the show notes for any of the resources that we mentioned during the podcast. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you have access to the latest and the greatest. You can connect with me on any of the socials at Real Roger Martin. And be sure to check out our website, thrivemorebrands.com. There you'll find information on the brands we support and information on franchising. Thanks again for tuning in.